machine learning, all these things these days. And they go across different disciplines really, really well. Um, and I would say that this is, this is, these are the areas for students to sort of develop um, further skill sets into while having an interest in, in biological sciences so that we can move things forward and be ready for 2050, right? So all this is causing a data deluge and we're calling it an informatics bottleneck because the data is coming from all different directions and we are sitting in a very classical 4B big data problems. So there's volume of data, which is the first problem, as I said, we don't know how many trillion cells in a wheat genome, which is six times the size of a human genome. And you know how many different varieties of wheat we might need to study to find the one which is perfectly suitable for this particular climate or this particular soil type and things like that. There's a variety of data, like as I said, long reads, short reads, this reads, that reads. Um, velocity data is generated at all different speeds and transferred at all different speeds across the globe and also the veracity or the trustworthiness of data because you know when data is transferred from one platform to another you, there's always a loss or there's you know some sort of file corruption happens so we we've, we've got all these classical challenges but having said that in um, western australia we're very very fortunate uh, to have a posi supercomputing center which gives uh, us which powered us with amazing uh, supercomputing resources like Magnus. We've got Zeus, which is amazing for visualization um, side of the thing, especially for 3D genomics. We've also got cloud, so we are able to work with uh, people across the globe by giving them, you know, access to our research cloud and collaboratively work and learn with people. That has come very, very handy for, for GNA Zoo, which is a global project, and also for data storage. Uh, it's one of the most expensive things in the world right now is to store your data, which you, so we are very fortunate that UWA is a, is a partner organization to POSI Supercomputing Center. So we get access to all these amazing resources. And not only that, we believe in uh, reproducible research, because if I'm able to, if I'm to, Reading a data which I'm analyzing here on my cluster, and if I give that data to you, you should be able to analyze the data and get exactly the same results. It's very, very important to have reproducible research, and for that, we practice containerized bioinformatics so that um, it's independent of the compute environment and it's kind of like readily uh, shareable and transferable to uh, everybody else we work with. With that, I would like to acknowledge all these amazing people and organizations who've given me an opportunity to work with them, came along on my journey, on my passions, and, um, and made this work possible. Um, and also to my son, here he is working with Abdi on the remote sensing side of the things. When he was only one year old, he's always been there. And all my colleagues who've been very, very accommodating. Uh, for a young uh, for a young family which I have to care for. So with that, I would like to say thank you to all of you for listening, being so patient. Um, and this is how we do uh, agriculture or other sciences at UWA. We try to enhance genetic gains and understanding through innovations and also paying attention to the nature around us. Uh, please feel free to follow me on Twitter at dr underscore pavinda i'll be very happy to take any questions we've got at this moment thank you thank you ma'am uh it's always when i uh, view your talk or listen to your talk it's feel like we know very small <laughs> it's it's many things we can we can do and is a great opportunity because uh, I know your uh, PhD and postdoc work. It's it's create a field like it's a long work and is a, a very a very systematically way you you did that phase of your research life. So it's create very much and very interesting new field. So, ma'am, there is a few question we have selected from our YouTube channel. Uh, I I'm going to paste it into the uh, into the uh, our chat box in zoom chat box there is a uh, i just wanted to paste here for you you can choose there is a uh, mentioning that uh, there is an arrow and uh, there is a uh, backets backets mean the name of the attendees and and the questions followed by the question mm -hmm. 
can you hear so, yes. yes i can see the chat box now okay so shall okay so i've got a question here which says can you share how you sample from 10k accessions to get the gold collection what are the parameters uh, and the question is from alvarino so um i hope i said your name right so but um how you so this is a method uh, called core collection development and there are a lot of publications around that how you develop core collections but the key key is that you look at many different layers of um, data collection to do that for example for our core collection particularly we had three layers of data we had agro um, we had um, eco geographical data like where the the accession is collected from we had agromorphological data uh, which is like you know all kind of parameters which were collected alongside when it was collected in terms of leaf um, petiole length leaf diameters everything agromorphological characters uh, and then we also had bioclim data associated with those um, geographical locations so there is a website called bioclim where you can actually put in a particular geographical location and you can get rainfall all sorts of parameters from that like what what is the height of that place and what is the amount of annual rainfall what is the wettest month what is the all sorts of things and then lastly we also generated a lot of molecular data and then using all these parameters you run it through many uh, different workflows and one of them is mstrat and then you can develop a core collection so there's a, there's a papers published on that so please feel, feel free to read for further details. I hope I've answered that question um, um, and explained to you. Um, so next question I've got from Iswar Egri. What are the benefits of contact mapping? Okay, um, Iswar, as I explained, uh, I hope I explained it well with the Homer Simpson slide. So if you do know that which part comes in contact with which part more often you do, um, so you do know that that means that those parts probably been sitting close enough to each other and that that helps you understand, you know, um, the architecture of the genome. So that that's what exactly contact mapping is like how far that contact or how often they contact each other. Can we use high C technology in plant or animal species which are not sequenced? Absolutely, that is, uh, that is exactly what we are doing. And that is, there's lots of examples, hundreds of examples for you to go and explore on DNA Zoo. Uh, on the DNA Zoo website, which I shared with you guys. Um, what makes, I've got another question from Jamir. What makes clover stand out from among the legumes? Can it be used as an important legume in India? It is used as a legume in India. I don't know the amount of uh, area under that, but it is worldwide used, and especially in the Mediterranean environments. And it's really, it stand out to me, and I think to a lot of other scientists, because it has got many unique characteristics, like, as I said, in the very, it's, it's very high in protein, um, it's a legume, it's very good for soil health, and it has adaptability, which is across different rainfall regions, some soil types and farming systems. So that makes it very, very unique. Um, instead of single seed descent method, can we use speed breeding technology? Absolutely. That's, it's just, uh, it's used anonymously. You can call it single seed descent because it's a very scientific way of doing it, but it's actually speed, speed breeding. You, you're fast, you're fast, making it fast, right? The same thing. Uh, Dr. Kanak Saxena is asking which software is used for integrative uh, omics. Uh, it's not one software. I just made up that term because I kind of connected. It's it's just my own uh, own creation. There is, there's nothing like that as integrative genomics. It's just that the, you connect different dots, different pieces of information which you've collected through different kind of omics technologies. Uh, I've got another question from Balkis. How can generic engineering or genetic engineering ensure environmental sustainability as well as increased food production when pressures on environmental resources like land and water is growing? Um, so to answer that question, um, I would like to take an example of the root hairs, which we have been, you know, we've been trying to extend the root hairs. So what happens is if you have better root hairs, you're able to um, 
you're able to find the micronutrients, you know, even if it is far away from you, if you're a plant, right? So that way, even if there's minute amounts of phosphorus present in the soils, you're able to find it and use it for your um, growth. So that's good, right? Because then you don't need to put a lot of phosphorus into the soil, which causes a lot of problems. Because if you put too much micronutrients into the soil, they go in the waterways and then they cause eutrophication, so many environmental hazards. So less is more, but you've got to be able to have ways to find that less, right? And that's what we are empowering our plants with using genome, genome editing. So nature has always selected. You know, nature is even now selecting among humans who can survive COVID. And you know, it's it's the same thing. You you do it yourself or nature does it to you. It's but there is a fine balance of upsetting that system. So yeah. Um I hope I answered that question. So next one is from Anita. Anila, what made you to choose to study clover over other plants? Okay, um, I think I had a slide on that one. So clovers, um, it's a diploid species, two copies, uh, small genome, inbreeding. So there was no like kind of, it's not changing every, every time, it's crossing with the other plants. So there was a lot of advantages to study clover because when you're starting in your career um, and you're exploring uh, some, there was, there was a lot to learn, to be honest. And you have to, you can do what, you can do in a certain amount of time. So you have to choose carefully a system, at least a system is established or a plant is good so that you can try other things. So there's a limit to what you can learn and explore, right? So that was one of the reasons. And I, I absolutely loved um, the clover connection with the methane and environmental impact I could make by, you know, doing some good work in that area. So that was, that was one of the reasons. And of course, the amazing people I worked with. Um, can clover be helpful in agriculture area during drought time and will it be able to fulfill food requirements? Um, sorry, it's it's a pasture. It's, uh, it's Humans do not consume it. It's for animals. It's a, it's a fodder species. But yes, it is, um, it, it has, um, we have identified genes which can make it survive in drought. Um, or less uh, water, uh, and which could be useful if you are able to transfer those genes or translate that information into other species like wheat or you know which humans eat. So everything is connected. You find something here, and then you can always you can go reverse genetics, as I showed you an example. And maybe that would be a useful thing to do in future. How AI and machine learning can be integrated in plant research? Okay, so there are many, I mean, it's, it's really your creativity, how you integrate it. Um, how I integrated it is I'm trying to use um, self-organization maps because there's so much data which is coming out of uh, the single cell genomics where we really, really need, um, you know, machine learning and AI to help us because uh, uh, trillions of cells in every cell, we we generate about 50,000 reads. So you multiply, I can't even multiply that number, like 37 trillion times 50,000 read for every single gene. And there's about 20,000 genes in every single cell. So there's kind of like a really big number. So that's why you need the computers, you need high performance computing, AI, machine learning, and all these tools. Um, Dinesh saying, can Clover Genome Database help to modify other crops for abiotic stress tolerance? Absolutely. So as I showed you guys in the integrated slide that you can translate information across very, very easily. Um, and that, that approach is called comparative genomics and you can do that. You can map orthologs, homolog genes and then look for uh, them in other species. Um, okay, so we got Diriba. In terms of coal collection, there is different factors which cause genetic drift and bottleneck in population. Absolutely, there are. And uh, um, I mean, we haven't studied that extensively in the clover, that thing, but there will be more students coming hopefully, hopefully on this journey and taking it over me and you know going that path as well. Um, Huzefa Bashir is asking, how can, high C be used to assess the sustainability of a genome in some horticultural crops. 
So uh, Roseva, there are there is a lot of horticultural crops. I just recently published the genome of guava, uh, and then we try and apply the highest technology to that as well so there's like you know there's you can use it's a technology it's a tool you can apply it to anything you yeah you can you can handle or you can specialize in so there is no restriction of species and the protocol is publicly available open source everything i have presented is open source research all the data is open source and so are the tools and technologies i hope i've answered all the questions and if but still if you got more questions uh find me on linkedin or uh, twitter and stay in touch <laughs>